Good afternoon. My name is Bethany and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Virgin Galactic's fourth quarter and full year 2021 earnings conference call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star followed by one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, please press star followed by two. Hosting today's conference call will be Liz Calvillo of Investor Relations. As a reminder, today's call is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference call over to Ms. Calvillo. Please go ahead. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Virgin Galactic's fourth quarter and full year 2021 earnings conference call. On the call with me today are Michael Cole Glazier, Chief Executive Officer, and Doug Ahrens, Chief Financial Officer. Following prepared remarks from Michael and Doug, we will open the call for questions. Our press release was issued about an hour ago and is available on our investor relations website, as well as a slide presentation that will accompany today's remarks. Let me refer you to slide two of the presentation, which contains our safe harbor disclaimer. During today's call, we may make certain forward-looking statements. These statements are based on current expectations and assumptions, and as a result, are subject to risks and uncertainties. Many factors could cause actual events to differ materially from the forward-looking statements made on this call. For more information about these risks and uncertainties, please refer to the risk factors in the company's filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission, filed by Virgin Galactic from time to time. Readers are cautioned not to put any undue reliance on forward-looking statements, and the company specifically disclaims any obligation to update the forward-looking statement that may be discussed during this call. Please also note that we will refer to certain non-GAAP financial information on today's call. You can find reconciliations of the non-GAAP financial measures for the most comparable GAAP measures in our earnings press release. With that, I would now like to turn the call over to Michael. Thanks, Liz. Good afternoon, everyone. Before we start today's presentation, I'd like to acknowledge the service and support of our first chairperson, Chamath Palahapatiya. As announced last week, Chamath has stepped down as our chair and board member to focus on other public company board committees. We've known the time would come when Chamath would move on to new initiatives. And I'm very pleased that long-term board member, Evan Lovell, who is the chief investment officer of the Virgin Group, has agreed to serve as interim chair until the permanent chair has been named. Spencer Stewart has been retained to lead the search for a permanent chairperson. They've already begun the process. I'd like to thank Chamath for his vision and groundbreaking work in transitioning Virgin Galactic to a public company, and also thank him for the support and insight that he's provided me over the past two years. Evan's deep experience with the company is a tremendous asset, and I'm excited to continue our excellent partnership as he steps into the interim chair role. Turning to slide four, 2021 was an incredibly important year for Virgin Galactic that laid an essential foundation towards becoming a scaled commercial operation. I'd like to call out a few highlights. We received approval from the FEA for our full commercial launch license marking the first time that the agency licensed a company to fly customers to space. We successfully completed two crewed space flights that demonstrated the value of our product and our unique customer experience. The enormous media and consumer response to these flights reinforced our belief that demand for space travel will outstrip supply for the foreseeable future. We began enhancements to our current vehicles to ready them for commercial service, and we initiated the design work on the next generation of our space flight system that will become the backbone of our future fleet. Today, our focus is on scaling our business in a methodical way. With regard to our current ships and near-term schedules, we remain on track and on schedule to launch commercial operations in the fourth quarter. Our vehicle enhancement program is progressing well and is expected to be completed in the third quarter. And we've opened ticket sales to the general public and expect to have our first 1,000 future astronauts signed up by the time we launch commercial service. With regards to our future fleet and medium-term business plan, we've adjusted our design and manufacturing strategy to have our internal resources primarily focused on engineering, R&D, final assembly, and test. We will then leverage partnerships within the aerospace ecosystem to develop our major sub-assemblies. 
We are putting into place the internal and supply chain infrastructure that will allow us to build our vehicles with high quality in a cost and time efficient fashion. We've built out our senior leadership team and we are continuing to attract and develop outstanding talent at all levels of the organization. All of these steps affirm confidence in our business model and our ability to generate attractive flight economics. Doug will share more detail about this later during the call. Turning to slide five and today's agenda, I'll start with an update on the readiness of our current fleet and then turn to our commercial plans, followed by an update on the manufacturing strategy for our future fleet. I'll then turn the call over to Doug, who will provide a financial update and some detail about our long-term economic model. Moving to slide six and our vehicle enhancement program. As I mentioned, we remain on track and on schedule to commence commercial service later this year. We are making excellent progress on the enhancements to our mothership Eve and our spaceship Unity. As we discussed last quarter, these modifications will meaningfully improve the durability, reliability, and predictability of these current ships and enable a higher frequency flight rate for commercial service. As we shared last quarter, Eve's enhancement program focuses on three areas modifications to the center wing and launch pylon, replacing the horizontal stabilizers, or H-stabs, located at the back of the vehicle, and completing upgrades to our avionics and mechanical systems, as well as strengthening various areas across the ship to reduce the volume of regular inspections. All of these modifications are designed to increase flight cadence, as well as overall service life. These three work streams on EVE are complex and interdependent and I'm pleased to share that all three are progressing towards completion in the third quarter. The work we are doing on VSS Unity is also progressing well, and the ship is expected to be completed in the third quarter. Unity's enhancements are designed to reduce maintenance needs by reinforcing and upgrading various joints and components located throughout the ship. As with EVE, the result of these efforts will be improved flight frequency, increased time between maintenance periods, and longer service life. Subject to testing and verification, we expect a monthly turnaround time for Unity. As a reminder, we anticipate that VSS Unity will begin flying revenue generating flights in the fourth quarter later this year. We remain on track to begin Imagine's commercial service in the first half of 2023. Flight testing is targeted to commence later this year, beginning with a captive carry flight. We will then move to glide flights and finally rocket powered flights. We anticipate Imagine will begin conducting revenue generating space flights in the first quarter of 2023, beginning with flying research payloads and then progressing to private astronaut flights alongside VSS Unity later in the year. We expect to see Unity flying monthly following its commercial launch, and we expect Imagine to fly twice per month once it finishes its flight test program. We're very excited at the prospect of delivering this level of capacity from our current ships. We are operating more efficiently even as we absorb the continuing impacts of the pandemic and related labor disruptions. We implemented a COVID vaccine policy in Q4 of 21 that required all employees to be fully vaccinated or have a legally entitled exemption. We are pleased that 94% of our workforce at the time complied with our policy and all new hires are also required to be in compliance. This has helped the company minimize the impacts of the virus, although we have experienced elevated sick rates as a result of the Omicron variant. As an added step to mitigate disruptions from near-term labor shortages, we shifted certain non-critical work from the fourth quarter of 21 into 2022. However, we do not expect these changes to impact the completion of our enhancement program or the launch of commercial service later this year. To date, we have not encountered any critical supply chain issues, but we are monitoring this carefully as we recognize that supply chains worldwide are under pressure. We are proactively planning ahead assessing supplier health, and ordering parts and materials further in advance to help mitigate potential raw material and labor availability issues. I'd like to extend a huge thanks to all of our teammates who have been working incredibly hard under pandemic-related protocols to deliver such great progress. Turning to slide seven, I am very pleased to share that Blair Rich has joined Virgin Galactic as our new President and Chief Business Officer for Commercial and Consumer Operations. In this newly created role, Blair will lead all aspects of our commercial strategy, including sales, marketing, business and product development, communications, operations, and customer experience. Blair brings a unique consumer-centric perspective to our company with an incredible blend of business, digital, 
and creative experience that she honed working with some of the most iconic brands in the entertainment industry. For the past year, she has served as a consultant and strategic advisor to Virgin Galactic, including guiding the marketing for the Unity 22 flight, which is viewed by tens of millions of people around the world. Blair will continue to play a critically important role in shaping our commercial strategy and enhancing our customer experience ahead of our commercial launch. With Blair's appointment, this rounds out our senior leadership team and ensures that we have deep expertise across all our key areas. Turning to slide eight, last week we launched our consumer brand and opened a limited number of space flight tickets to the general public. And we plan to have our first 1,000 customers signed up in advance of the launch of our commercial operations later this year. Given the robust response from our space fairs and early hand raisers, we have approximately 250 seats remaining and demand through our direct sales channel is strong. As a reminder, we hold a $150,000 deposit against the total cost of $450,000, $25,000 of which is a non-refundable membership fee. Following the closure of our first 1,000 astronaut window, we will build a highly qualified reservation pipeline of future customers through a priority list with a $10,000 deposit required to join. We expect to leverage earned and digital media, as well as word of mouth referrals from our ongoing flights to continuously supply the top of the funnel with new prospects, which we can then efficiently filter using our CRM tools and sales processes. Turning to slide nine and our future astronaut membership. Membership is included with ticket purchase, which adds additional appeal for customers and highlights our unique experience and service, distinguishing Virgin Galactic's offering in the industry. Future astronaut community members enjoy access to Money Can't Buy experiences, events, trips, and activities around the world, all delivered with trademark Virgin style. We provide opportunities to connect directly with the Virgin Galactic team, offering members deeper knowledge of our aerospace, flight, and engineering programs. Customers also gain exclusive access to Spaceport America, enjoy parabolic flights, centrifuge training, and VIP attendance at launches to name just a few of the benefits. Trips will include memorable opportunities, like the inaugural Space for the Curious Summit that we will be hosting later this year, a multi-day destination experience that's both intellectually engaging and entertaining. Past events have taken members to locations including Antarctica and Idaho to view the solar eclipse and the world-renowned Necker Island. This membership program builds engagement from the minute of purchase through the space flight. And we expect the high affinity that comes from these members to translate into repeat visitation, numerous referrals, and extensive lifetime customer value. Turning to slide 10 and the manufacturing strategy for our future fleet. While three human space flights per month from our current ships is an impressive task, we seek to open space to a much larger audience, and this requires a larger fleet capable of flying at much higher flight rates. In the past several months, we have spent a significant amount of time redesigning our manufacturing approach, and I'd like to outline how this will enable us to scale our operations and maximize efficiencies. Our current ships, Unity, Imagine, and Eve, have primarily been delivered in a fully in-house design, manufacturing, and assembly environment. This approach has been critical during our flight test phase, although it is a relatively slow and expensive process. As we step forward into higher rate commercial service, we will be augmenting our capabilities with strategically selected tier one suppliers to deliver major sub-assemblies in a cost and time efficient manner. This is particularly important for our Delta class spaceship and next generation mothership programs. Our approach takes advantage of the nationwide aerospace ecosystem to tap into talented pre-existing pools of labor and optimize timing of capital expenditures. It also focuses our in-house expertise on design and engineering, final assembly, and fabrication of complex and critical parts that are all important elements of our intellectual property. Overall, we expect that this will provide us with a cost-effective and highly efficient manufacturing model for building out our Delta fleet and future motherships. As I mentioned on our last earnings call, we've established a new engineering, design, and corporate headquarters based in the strong aerospace corridor that runs from El Segundo to San Diego. This serves as our primary hub for R&D and the design of our new vehicles. We are currently focused on evolving the designs of our spaceship and mothership to enable greater flight cadence, as well as to support third-party supply of major sub-assemblies. 
is an excellent location for innovation and collaboration, and we continue to ramp up engineering and support team talent at this location. We are also progressing designs and choice of locations for a new final assembly facility for our spaceships. We expect this final assembly facility to be operational in late 2023, and it will eventually employ hundreds of technicians and engineers with production capability of up to six spaceships a year. Similar to our approach with the Delta-class spaceships, where we focus on the upfront design and engineering, as well as final assembly, we are in the late stages of negotiation with preferred suppliers to manufacture the next generation of our motherships. We believe that leveraging strategic partners to build these major sub-assemblies will allow us to increase our speed to market and realize meaningful efficiencies without sacrificing quality or performance. Turning to slide 11, I will now turn the call over to Doug for an update on our financials. Thanks, Michael, and good afternoon, everyone. Before I review the financial results for the quarter and full year, I'd like to begin with a few comments on our broader financial strategy and economic model. We are making good progress in preparing our fleet and laying the groundwork for more efficient operations going forward. To help fund these initiatives, we raised $425 million through a convertible debt offering last month. We timed this capital raise to take advantage of the low interest rate environment ahead of expected rate increases. Furthermore, we entered a separate capped call transaction to effectively establish a 100% conversion premium. In other words, we have hedged our equity dilution risk up to a share price of $20.06. As of the end of January, we had approximately $1.3 billion of available liquidity, which represents the balance as of the end of the fourth quarter adjusted to the net proceeds from the capital raise. We are well positioned for the investments we're making to drive the growth in the business. We continue to see significant demand for our space flight services. Our key objectives are to cost effectively expand our fleet and set ourselves up for long run profitability. We will target investments in key areas to maximize shareholder value while also preserving capital along the way. We plan to invest upfront in NRE or non-recurring engineering to optimize our design of the Delta class ships for efficient manufacturing. This is a major leap forward for our manufacturing capability. Following our NRE investments, we expect that the subsequent ships will be produced in a repeatable, scalable fashion that drives a significant reduction in cost per vehicle relative to our current ships. What this means is that as our final assembly facility ramps up operations, we anticipate it will be capable of cost-effectively producing up to six spaceships per year. We expect this will enable a rapid increase in flight capacity that will fully utilize Spaceport America and allow for fast expansion to additional spaceports. Our manufacturing strategy is also geared to leverage the well-established supply chain in the aerospace industry. As Michael mentioned, we plan to internally retain and build upon our IP in design and engineering while also drawing upon Tier 1 suppliers to provide major sub-assemblies. Virgin Galactic, in turn, will focus on final assembly and integration. This manufacturing approach streamlines our fleet ramp-up by allowing us to rely on the best practices of existing supplier networks behind our direct suppliers. It will also reduce the total capital expenditure for infrastructure required to scale our fleet. Where possible, we plan to preserve our cash in the near term by deferring cash outflows to better match inflows. Examples of this include leasing versus building or buying, leveraging development incentives where accretive to our business model, and selective use of high quality partners in the aerospace ecosystem to leverage pre-existing workforce talent, infrastructure, and supply relationships. Turning to slide 12. Unlocking the economic potential of commercial space flight requires maximizing vehicle flight rate. As a reminder, following the completion of the current enhancement period, we expect to be able to fly our Unity spaceship on monthly intervals and our Imagine spaceship on two-week intervals. We plan to supercharge our flight rates with the introduction of Delta-class ships, which we expect to be able to fly on one-week intervals. With support from the planning and design efforts that have been completed over the past few months, we are now able to provide more visibility into the economic model we are targeting. While we are not providing multi-year guidance, we want to share additional insights about our objectives as we scale the business. Based on our current schedules, 
we anticipate our Delta class ships could be ready to conduct revenue payload flights in late 2025 and progress into private astronaut flights in 2026. We are also planning to have next generation motherships available to pair with the Delta class spaceships as we scale the fleet. Our factory expansion plans are targeting production levels of up to six new spaceships per year, taking into account the expected weekly flight cadence for the Delta class ships and the resulting growth in revenue from the expanding fleet, we are aiming for positive free cash flow by 2026. We have a range of options for the level of investment we choose to pursue. Given the strong demand we are seeing for space flights, combined with the prior investments in NRE, factory capacity, and other infrastructure, we foresee very favorable economics with the addition of each incremental spaceship to our fleet. Therefore, we expect to lean into the growth trajectory and continue with the expansion of our fleet and the potential addition of multiple spaceports. Our projected operating model reflects a low variable cost structure for individual flights. Our primary variable costs include operating expenses, such as a rocket motor and other fuels, as well as lodging and training for the astronauts. Furthermore, we expect to realize economies of scale as we add multiple ships to our fleet, because we anticipate that we will be able to spread our fixed costs over more ships and flights. Examples of our fixed costs are fleet maintenance, the flight crew, and rent. With the planned addition of Delta-class ships to our fleet and the anticipated increase in utilization of the spaceport, adjusted EBITDA margins could be above 30%. Turning to slides 13 and 14, we'll now review our results for the fourth quarter and the full year. Free cash flow was negative $67 million, compared to negative $74 million in the prior year period. This cash outflow was less than our previously shared guidance for the fourth quarter. The lower spend was primarily attributable to labor efficiencies achieved during the quarter and by the shift in certain non-critical path work from the fourth quarter to 2022 both of which resulted in lower spending than previously forecast. As Michael noted, this shift of work and the associated spend is not expected to impact our timing to complete our enhancement program or the launch of commercial service later this year. The shift of work reflects enhanced planning, foresight, and contingency efforts from our team to ensure that we remain on track to deliver on time. Looking at the income statement, we generated revenue of $140,000 in the quarter primarily driven by astronaut membership fees associated with new ticket sales. Gap operating expenses for the fourth quarter totaled $81 million compared to $74 million in the prior year equivalent period. The increase in expenses was primarily due to higher employee costs and non-cash stock-based compensation expenses, as well as the opening of ticket sales. These increases were partially offset by a decrease in contract labor and material costs associated with the development of our spaceflight system. Total non-GAAP operating expenses were $65 million, compared to $60 million in the prior year period. GAAP net loss for the fourth quarter was $81 million, compared to a loss of $104 million in the fourth quarter of 2020. The reduction in net loss was attributable to there no longer being any outstanding warrants as well as an increase in stock-based competition expense. Adjusted EBITDA was negative $65 million compared to negative $60 million in the prior year period. Moving on to our financial results for the full year 2021. We generated total annual revenue of $3.3 million. We received revenue from sponsorship and payload services associated with two space flights conducted during the year as well as revenue earned from completion of certain technical milestones related to the Italian spaceflight agreement. As previously mentioned, we also received revenue for astronaut membership fees associated with new ticket sales. Net loss for fiscal year 2021 was $353 million, compared to a $645 million net loss in fiscal year 2020. Adjusted EBITDA totaled negative $245 million fiscal year 2021, compared to negative $232 million for fiscal year 2020. Our balance sheet remains an area of strength for us. As of December 31st, 2021, we had cash, cash equivalents, and marketable securities of approximately $931 million, which does not reflect our capital raise in January of this year. Looking ahead, 
and a point to note about how we will be presenting some of our financial information going forward. Beginning with the first quarter of 2022, we will no longer be providing gross margin on our GAAP income statement. Ultimately, the nature of our company is that of a service provider rather than that of a manufacturer. While we do manufacture our vehicles, unlike other aerospace companies, we do not offer our vehicles for sale as standalone products. Rather, we use the vehicles we produce to operate our space line, and as such, our revenue is derived from space light services. Within GAAP guidance, in 2022, we are adopting the format of an income statement akin to that of major airlines, hospitality, and service companies. As I said earlier, given our differentiation as the first commercial space line, our margin profile is expected to be much higher than typically seen in those industries. As for our guidance on spending for the first quarter, we are completing the enhancement period on multiple vehicles concurrently while ramping the development work for our future fleet. We forecast free cash flow for the first quarter of 2022 to be in the range of negative 75 to $85 million. We are confident that this work will provide real benefits to our flight rate and service life over the long term, while also optimizing for shareholder returns as we expand the fleet. I'd like to now hand the call back to Michael. Thanks, Doug. Turning to slide 15, I am very pleased with the progress we made during the fourth quarter and the full fiscal year 2021. 2022 is an important year for all of us at Virgin Galactic. Thanks to the dedication of our team, we are on track and on schedule to launch commercial service in the fourth quarter, and we expect to be flying three times a month when Imagine joins Unity and Passenger Service in mid-23. We are well on our way to signing up our first 1,000 astronauts before we launch commercial service, and we are scaling our business in an efficient and methodical way. Coming months will continue to be very busy for us, and I'm looking forward to sharing future updates on our progress. So with that, we'll turn to questions. Operator, we are ready to begin the Q&A portion of the call. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please press star followed by one on your telephone keypad. If for any reason you would like to remove that question, please press star followed by two. Again, to ask a question, please press star one. As a reminder, if you're using a speakerphone, please remember to pick up your handset before asking your question. We will pause here briefly to allow questions to generate in queue. The first question is from the line of Oliver Chen with Cowan. Please proceed. Hi, Michael and Doug. Uh, congrats on the opening sales. Michael, I would love your thoughts on the nature of demand that you've been seeing since you've opened the sales and how it informs you know, your view of pricing as well as you know, thinking more broadly about friends and family and, and all the opportunities you may have ahead. Um, also, Michael, on the commercial and consumer operations, I know you have new talent in that division. Um, what are your thoughts about key priorities there and how they might work in conjunction with what you're doing uh, in terms of Delta class and the scaling efforts you're making? Thanks a lot. Thanks, Oliver. So the nature of the demand, you know, as we talked on the last quarter, we had a group of folks who were kind of raised their hand earlier. We called them the space bears. And there are around 1,000 people with a de minimis um, uh, deposit that they put down. And we had around 300 of those, I'm sorry, around 100 of those people, 100 of those 1,000 uh, joined. So that brought us up to about 700 people. And what we just announced this past week, the week that just passed, is we've now opened up um, sales of our first, the remaining uh, available slots within our first 1,000 future astronauts to the general public. And that's the first time uh, we've been really open up to the general public, uh, you know, leveraging digital channels to do so. We picked up uh, plus or minus around 50 additional uh, reservations uh, before we opened it up to the general public, uh, some that carried in from the space fairs, some from some early hand raisers. And so you asked, you know, kind of the nature of the demand. Uh, first, I'd say of the way we're processing our demand is by you know, sharing what we do. Uh, the biggest thing was on that Unity 22 flight. That brings a lot of people into kind of our, our systems and allows us to engage in a conversation. Uh, it's a pretty wide group of audience. Some of them are going to be brand fans. Some of them will be people aspiring to the future. 
uh, but many of them are wanting to fly now. We use a series of uh, customer journey communications to bring them into a group that really is high probability of wanting to fly right away. And then we use a uh, one-on-one -on -one sales call around that. We have uh, seen the majority of the seats we're still seen as individual flyers, but we have seen sales across uh, all the products we offer. Uh, so individual flyers, uh, couples, either friends or family together, as well as uh, just a full ship purchase. And uh, also, of course, we continue to focus on sales and our research piece. So it's a, a good mix across the products uh, mix. And the other thing I'd say in the nature of the demand is these are people who you know, pretty uniformly aren't looking at this as just kind of a, a quick transactional purchase. This is a, a life moment for them. And that's why we put so much effort into our um, kind of membership community. And you, know, you mentioned maybe shifting. Uh, Blair Rich joined as our uh, president chief business officer for our commercial and consumer operations group. Uh, at the time when we are flying, part of that group's responsibilities will be actually handling of all the future astronauts and friends and family, managing the astronaut campus where people come. But up front, not only is this group managing the sales, but then immediately bringing people into this future astronaut community and, and engaging them. And the consistent thing that we have found in these early calls are people recognizing the value of that. This is going to be something that is for their lives. Uh, they want to prepare thoughtfully for it. And that's uh, also helped us um, kind of onboard people and quickly get them uh, excited about the you know, time period ahead, their flight and the time after. Okay, and a follow-up, Doug. Um, the guidance is very helpful in cash flow of negative 75 to 85 in Q1. As as we think about um, your leveraging of strategically leveraging suppliers, um, how might the cash burn evolve uh, in terms of that happening over time? Uh, any puts and takes or thoughts uh, longer term? Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Oliver. Um, yeah, so we guided for one quarter, and we didn't guide beyond that, but I can tell you directionally that as you look at the work streams that will be coming in, where we are going through the NRE phase, the design, lining up the supply chain and the factory and so on, you would expect to see some increases in our spending as we build out the fleet, essentially. And, you know, the, the focus there, of course, is uh, the fleet expansion, because that's where we're going to get the, the great returns in the business. So, that's our, our primary focus for the investment. We are leveraging the supply chain, um, as you reiterated there. And what that allows us to do is tap into their best practices, their processes, their suppliers, you know, behind them, um, and also minimize our capital investment. So we pay them for the delivery of sub-assemblies rather than having to invest in the whole factory to do all the parts fabrication ourselves. So that's the type of uh, efficiency we can get by tapping into that supply chain, which helps our overall capital investment in, uh, in a favorable way. Thank you. Best regards. Thanks, Oliver. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chen. The next question comes from the line of Kristen Wang with Morgan Stanley. You may proceed. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, guys. Um, uh, Michael, Doug, uh, you know, following up on Oliver's question there on the free cash flow burn, once you start investing in Delta, can you provide a little bit more color on that? How much will it cost? And then also, can you provide more color regarding the maturity of the design uh, for, for, for Delta and your negotiations with these Tier 1 suppliers? Are they fixed, or is this still currently in the works? Sure, Christine. Thanks for the question. Um, this is Doug. I'll take the first one and then hand over to Michael. Um, so regarding the cost, uh, we're at a stage now um, you know, with Delta where we're narrowing the list of suppliers for the sub-assemblies and working through that. And you know, we're, we're going through the, the process here uh, in terms of um, defining that and basically entering the, the early stages of that process, the negotiation process. So at this stage, it's a it's a little premature to be disclosing the cost per vehicle. Uh, so I think you can understand our position where we're at in that life cycle. So it wouldn't be in our best interest to put all of that out there, but um, that's something we'll be able to share more on um, in the future uh, as we narrow down the, the, um, 
you know, the specifics with the supply chain. Um, but Michael, maybe you'd like to talk about the progression on the Delta. Sure. Just, um, you know, we have two main parts of our program that we need to scale the fleet. The first is with our motherships that takes us uh, through the first stage and then the Delta spaceship class itself. The motherships are, are quite advanced in the discussions that we've had. Uh, we don't have something to share today specifically, but I think in the not too far distant future, uh, we'll be coming back there. And that's been, I think, a, a good set of conversations uh, that reinforces the strategy. There are really quality uh, people out there in the aerospace ecosystem that we can uh, create value for them uh, while also uh, keeping the right things that we do ourselves, namely the design, uh, getting everything set to put out major sub-assemblies, and then we'll do the kind of final assembly test quality safety piece. So the mothership, I'd say, quite advanced in that dialogue there. Uh, the Delta class ships, we have been putting our investments and time uh, we've kind of moved through the basic trade spaces, but the, we are now kind of getting into really refined requirements ahead of issuing the RFIs and the RFPs. So we've narrowed our list of uh, potential suppliers into a pool. Uh, we are well on the way to pick a location for where we will do our final assembly. Uh, so we're not quite ready to announce that yet, but we've uh, made great progress there. And um, as you heard from Doug, we've been able to share some context on, uh, well, it's not appropriate to give multi-year guidance. We do want to share context on our internal planning horizons so people have kind of insight into our own goals and objectives that we're sharing with our teams. And, and Christine, I can add a little more too about the cost, uh, the way to think about the cost. So the approach we're taking here is we're investing in the NRE and the digital tools, and you'll often hear about this digital twin approach, which the, you know, the leading aerospace companies will take. And what this allows us to do uh, with this more advanced modeling and digital tools is we have more predictable uh, parts uh, fabrication, you know, to tolerances, and then the, the, the easier uh, manufacturing comes from that. So that allows us to, you know, again, invest up front in that design, which leads to a cost-effective and repeatable, um, you know, manufacturing approach where we can uh, create copies of this vehicle at a much lower cost than what we've been able to do before. So um, the advancement in these tools and the modeling capability is really going to help with that cost structure in the future versus how it used to be. Great. Thank you for all the color, guys. And if I could do a one follow-up, I mean, you talked about the return to service of Unity, then Imagine, and, you know, you're building the Delta class. So does this mean that, you know, Inspire is completely um, off the table and, you know, it's not going to be built at this point? Yeah, it's it's we're keeping it right where we were before. It's a good option value for us. Uh, we have the ability to finish it and complete it if we so choose. Uh, it also has potential use uh, as part of the process to uh, really go through and create a um, true production model vehicle. Uh, so it has potential use in kind of a copper bird scenario as we're working through our avionics. Uh, but it's also one that we can come back to. So uh, right now our focus, as you can tell, is uh, really accelerating our work on the Delta uh, class vehicle itself. Uh, so we haven't uh, made the final choice on Inspire and just are keeping it kind of in our optionality base there, but our focus is clearly on pushing to the Deltas. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Christine. Thank you, Ms. Lewak. The next question comes from the line of Miles Walton with UBS. Please go ahead. Thanks. Good afternoon. Um, and thanks for the color on uh, the fleet build out. I was curious, um, as it relates to the 2026 positive cash flow, is the assumptions that you're, you're at that stage still running um, CapEx pretty aggressively at this six per year build rate for the, the spaceships and then maybe one of the motherships? And so your, your positive cash flow with that level of CapEx or is the idea that you're through the CapEx at that point. Thanks. Sure, I'll take that. Uh, good question, Michael Miles. Um, so we actually have a range of options of how, um, how much to lean into that growth, um, but the scenarios all kind of point to the same uh, general outcome, which is uh, cash flow positive. You know, it's, it's a, uh, the scenario we, we end up with here for the company in 2026. 
um, regardless of that number of, of ships. So we can um, get there with a more moderate number of ships, uh, or we can continue to invest and we still cross over because of the a rapid increase in the revenue and the profits that come from that, which starts to um, you know, far outweigh the, the ongoing investment. Uh, with that said, what we see is at that stage in our life cycle, because we've invested in all this NRE and the factory capacity and the spaceport and everything, there are real benefits to continuing to invest and leaning into that growth trajectory because the incremental profits from each uh, added vehicle are, are really um, you know, very attractive. Um, so the further we go, the further um, it, it moves us on that profit curve. So um, you know, our, our likely case is to continue to lean into that and invest in additional uh, fleet expansion. And, okay. and I would add- And there's one other- you know, that point, oh, I would also, we would be looking to this next spaceport too. So uh, just continuing that, the next that question. trajectory, we would have- Yeah, <laughs> I, I saw it coming. Um, so we would have, um, you know, the factory capacity ready to keep producing spaceships, um, we would like to leverage that. And, you know, that would be kind of the, you know, after we populate the first spaceport, we'd be looking to continue that, those efficiencies, and then populate the second spaceport and get the economies of scale in that second spaceport. Okay. Okay. And I think you answered that one. So the only other one I had was um, for the first thousand spacefarers, are you through that entire lot by the end of 2026 at this point, based on your plan? Yeah, you know, I'm sorry. I'm probably Doug, forgive me. I'm looking at Doug. Um, I believe we will, you know, we've probably given you enough uh, data out there to track this. So we do expect our current fleet uh, will be flying uh, three times a month uh, as we get going in having Imagine come in in the first half of 23. Um, so that gives you kind of a, a sense of growth until we get our first delta out. We think the first delta, you know, again, we're we're trying to have a balance here, Miles. You know, it's it's not appropriate to give guidance in multi-year places in the human spaceflight program, but we also want to share you know, some of our internal planning, yeah. you know, uh, objective yeah. horizon. So we we believe we are building our own uh, kind of build out and project plan to see the first delta coming out with research flights, revenue driving research flights at the end of 25, moving into private astronauts in 26. So you can start to do some of that math on, on where the numbers will play. Um, I would just flag that as you start to then bring in deltas on a, uh, a much more accelerated ramp up, and again, with a weekly flight cadence and six seats per, we very quickly start to uh, hit bigger numbers there. So. Uh, anything that's not, I'd say, quite taken up by that 26 period uh, would be done very quickly thereafter. Okay. Thanks again. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Walton. Our next question comes from the line of Greg Conrad with Jeffries. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening. Can you just Maybe, um, you know, talk about the six-year production for Delta. You talked about that as a peak. You know, what's the timing of making that decision, and what kind of drives peak rate, and, and how did maybe the economics of the spaceship change at six a year versus maybe a lower rate? So, you know, we used to, and just to make sure I heard the question correctly, you're talking about the number of ships per year that we would uh, use in our final assembly facility? Uh, exactly, production of Delta. So we definitely want to have um, kind of our supply chain and our final assembly plan able to handle that cadence. And the reason is, as Doug mentioned, when we've invested the NRE upfront, uh, from what uh, our plans show, we were going to have very attractive flight economics on a per vehicle basis. So. Uh, scaling that is, is really strong and the economics support that uh, approach. So up to six is an interesting balance. It allows us to take, you know, the first year, year and a half of that and, and kind of finish out or top off Spaceport America from a fleet standpoint. And then that allows us to get to then a second spaceport. And, you know, you've got now uh, at the fast end, probably one and a half, two years, you top that one out, and then you could go to the next and the next spaceports. 
know, at some point you start to come back around uh, again to um, just continue to update the fleets over time. And so where we say up to six, uh, there are really easy breakpoints of, you know, you can run at four if we would prefer, uh, or at six, you know, just from a shifting standpoint there, and still take great um, kind of leverage off the tooling we've put in place and the lines we've put in place. So it gives us the ability to pace a little bit with our uh, demand, but uh, as we've, you know, continued to say so far, we feel demand is going to outstrip supply for quite a while. So we don't need to overdo it. I think that gives us a solid pace. Uh, we definitely believe that the people who fly with us uh, up front will want to fly in other locations and have word of mouth that will drive that. But we also think it's important to go to other locations in the world. Uh, I just think that will bring in both heavier localized markets uh, as well, uh, but also variety. And I just think we're going to build a great lifetime value with our uh, existing customers who want to go and have different places they can see the world from space. So this gives us good flexibility and I think uh, allows us to just kind of pace that um, as, as we see demand and as we, we choose to invest in the speed of growth. And then this, this might be pushing it a little bit too much, but I mean, appreciate the, the long-term business model. I mean, I think you talked about 30% EBITDA margins, free cash flow positive in 2026. I mean, as you ramp, is there any way to think about a conversion relative to EBITDA and maybe some of the offsets, whether it's working capital or, or CapEx, and how we kind of think about EBITDA converting to, to free cash flow as you kind of get scale? I'm trying to make sure I understand your question when you talk about converting. Uh, can you just can you repeat the question? Just you know, EBITDA converts at you know 50% free cash flow or 100% EBITDA to free cash flow conversion. Just trying to think about you know bridging EBITDA conversion, the 30% margin to maybe what the free cash flow potential is. Yeah, I, I think. Um, you know, that question is related to the pace of growth, right? As we continue to move quickly into additional spaceports, obviously we'd use uh, some of that free cash flow into the fleet itself. Uh, to the degree we choose to go a little slower in there, then you're going to see more uh, flowing through um, and truly being free. So I, th I think it is, you know, as we said, it's premature to guide. We're not trying to guide here. We're trying to give some awareness into our have own internal planning. Uh, so probably, you know, as you said, probably a, too much of a stretch at this moment. But I do think, uh, as Doug said, we see really strong returns uh, as we come out. We've made the investments in the non-recurring engineering. Uh, the demand remains strong. It will be a good um, kind of financial return, which is really where we look about how do we deploy our capital. What does that look like from a shareholder return basis? Uh, that feels like we will want to lean into that. So I think, um, you know, We'll be trying to do so in a in a self managed way by that point, uh, but I think there's a lot of opportunity and upside for us as we do. Let me Thank add you. regarding uh, the, the timing of the EBITDA. So when I was referring to EBITDA, you know, potentially being over 30 percent, that's as we start to um, get utilization, uh, good utilization of the spaceport. So uh, as you as you think about uh, multiple Delta class spaceships, um, you know, populating Spaceport America. Uh, you're starting to get some good utilization going. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be fully utilized, but um, well, well, well utilized. You start to get that kind of uh, scale going. That's when you get those, um, you know, the free cash flow uh, being positive and the EBITDA approaching those percentages I talked about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Conrad. There are no additional questions waiting at this time. That concludes the Virgin Galactic's fourth quarter and full year 2021 earnings conference call. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. You may now disconnect your line.